This is The Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer brand and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. In the haircare and beauty industry, there's really no one more well-known as an individual than Frederick Fakai. Uh, his name is synonymous with luxury, with fashion, with beauty, uh, and with France. And it's really thrilling for me to catch up with him. He's a friend, but also uh, I really followed his career for all of mine. And um, we talk about sustainability and media and how to build a brand uh, in the 21st century. He runs two brands, uh, Bastide, and he, he recently purchased his uh, namesake brand back, uh, Fakai. And he is um, really a great thinker, a charming individual, and someone who is um, incredibly progressive when it comes to wellness and mindfulness uh, in consumer products and luxury today. So let's get started. Frederick, thank you so much for joining me on the safari. Thank you, Mort, for having me. I mean, I love, uh, I told my daughter that I was going on a safari this morning. <laughs> Good. Yes, they are indeed. Our daughters are friends, which is wonderful. Um, they'll be very happy to hear themselves. There we go. Cecilia and Daisy are mentioned on the safari. They're going to be thrilled. So um, thank you for, for doing this. And obviously, there's a lot to cover because you've had this incredible career and in some ways have just reinvented it yet again. Obviously, your namesake brand has had, um, you sold it very successfully and then now most recently uh, have repurchased it uh, and put it into a holding company named Blue Mistral, uh, which is, for the English people here, Blue Mistral, mm -hmm. uh, or the Americans, I should say, which has Bastide and Fakai and Atelier Fakai. So tell us a little bit about um, the, the, the backstory first. I mean, there's, there's so much to deal with today, but let's at least spend a, a few moments talking about how you got into this CPG business and the, the, so the, the beauty business and the hair care business uh, starting in France. Yes, thank you. Well, Mort, this is, a, you know, it's like, uh, it's not a business plan really written. You know, this life is a, uh, happened organically. Uh, I came here in New York after living in Paris where I was working for a French company called Jacques de Sange. And also I was also working as a consultant for the big group L'Oréal. And uh, uh, when I arrived here in 1983, you know, we launched the first salon, a uh, French Jacques de Sange salon. And uh, um, soon after, I thought I was coming here for one year mm. and then move on to another city. And soon after that, I realized that New York was really a fantastic. You, you have to remember the 80s in New York was Unbelievable! <laughs> it was really amazing. That's a whole other podcast. Exactly, I think. exactly. So, so, um, so uh, I came here, and then uh, sh uh, shortly after, I got a call, and you would remember that from Don Mello, of course, a bird of Goodman, bird of Goodman, yes, who uh, have was tipped by Ralph Lauren and uh, and Calvin Klein. Uh, that uh, uh, I was the stylist, the hairdresser to go see, uh, to take over their salon at Birdhoff. So she came to get a haircut with me, incognito, and I didn't know which she was and did her hair. Just a couple hours later, I got a call uh, to meet with her, and at the time, Ira Mark, the CEO. Yeah, the late Ira Mark. Yes. So they offered me the salon, which was on the seventh floor, and to take over. Uh, so I didn't have the money uh, at the time, but also I was, you know, I was French, so I didn't realize that you could run a salon on the seventh floor. You know, I thought it was 
everything was on the mainstream on the mm-hmm. on the grand floor so i declined it and uh, two days later my fortune came but when i went to have dinner at Indochine with the whole group at the time, yeah. you know, Calvin Klein and uh, Steve Rubel, Bianca Jagger, Jan Schrager, all of this. It, 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 and I realized that oh, oh, Calvin came to me and says, so how did the meeting go? And I say, well, great. I think uh, uh, Don is a lovely lady and the uh, store is magnificent, but... You know, that salon looked like a warehouse on the seventh floor. So I said, no. He says, are you stupid? <laughs> this is the most amazing department store in the whole United States. You could just change it, do whatever you want. And, and, and this is, there's nothing better than that. So I took it over. I went back and didn't know what to do. So I went back and I said, how do I get this back? So... I called Don Melo and I say, Don, I have an idea. Can we change the model? I don't like hair salons. So can we do something different? And I say, and what do you have in mind? So I said, why don't we have, I want to have the beauty institute. I want to have the salon. I want to have the cafe as well. And I really want to do an environment. Mm -hmm. And I want to change the way salons are. And I want, I don't want this old fashioned, you know, it was owned previously by a, a Roman, uh, Sergio Valente, a uh, hairdresser of Valentino. So it was really, you know, like, uh, ornate, uh, ornate, uh, you know, baroque. I said, I don't want that. I want more sleek, more modern. And she looked at me. She said, stay here for a second. And a couple of minutes later, she came back with Ira, Ira Nima. And they were very excited by the idea. And that's how I created my first salon in 1989, who was called by Women's Wear Daily the first day spa. So this is where I revolutionized the idea of salon because at the time there was no cellular phone. So every station had a landline for every customer. Mm. Um, We had lunch, breakfast. So So they never wanted to leave, right? No, exactly. And then... I also changed the way the salon was. So the reception, was, we were not making any appointment there. It was really a reception. You, we welcomed the customer. The, 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 the customer service agent, as I call them, the receptionist, they were just dedicated to welcoming grid. Yeah. And then the, the, the back office would make the appointment. And then also we, we separated away the color department, you know, because salon were messy. Everybody was doing hair, color, and the same stations. Mm. So I separated a technical color department on one side, the styling department. Then I created a lounge. And then I also created a beauty bar who was actually run by Bobby Brown. Mm. And this was an amazing knee hive because, uh, 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 beehive, sorry. It, it, it was all the ladies from, you know, uh, uh, the VIP ladies of New York, uh, Cindy Crawford, uh, Linda Evangelista, Naomi Campbell, uh, Barbara Walter, uh, Katie Couric, all, I'm dating myself here, but all these incredible people. It was unbelievable. John John Kennedy. Yeah. Um, it, it was fantastic. What's really interesting about hearing you speak about the, the, the way you, the service level, uh, was, and with, if there's been a theme over the last three or four podcasts, um, we had Ken Himmel uh, yesterday uh, here from Related talking about the importance of hospitality in retail. Same with the guys from Value Retail, Scott Malkin and and Rossi uh, from Milk Studios about how they were almost like the factory, you know, of uh, of Andy Warhol. This notion that um, you hire people from the hospitality industry to create environments, right? And so. Feels though you in your industry were uh, like them in their own ways in their different fields, uh, doing the same thing. Yes, and Jan Schrager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab- absolutely. And so I think the, um, the the amazing thing is that you started this this business, you wrote it all the way up, uh, you sold it very successfully, and then um, you sold it to Procter and Gamble. Is that right? That's right. And how did that feel uh, selling your namesake brand? You know, it's, it's interesting because 
at the time, uh, uh, I had a partner, you know, a private equity partner, and uh, uh, they wanted to sell. So I had no choice to sell, and the price was very attractive, which is great. But then later on, you know, I realized a couple of years later that the brand were not going in the direction I thought it was going to go. So their vision collapsed. Mm. They didn't follow through. They changed management. And we know the, from the headlines what happened after that to, with PNG. They got distracted with too many things and had to sell many brands. So, so later on, you know, I got so bored and I was looking at finding other brands and even in fashion. And then I came across this beautiful little brand in France called Cote Bastide, who was run by a, a family. And I thought, my God, you know, I'm going to do the opposite of what PNG does, or Unilever, all this thing. I'm going to go artisanal. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started to create this, you know, rebrand Bastide to mm -hmm. Bastide and use only artisan manufacturers that were family owned and do clean beauty. So for the listener who knows your namesake brand now, Fekai, uh, in the hair care space, describe Bastide and the products that it sells. So Bastide is, is basically a wellness lifestyle brand. It's all sensual soil. It's originated from the south of France, the southeast of France, Aix-en-Provence. Mm -hmm. And it's really based about all the ingredients from Provence. And uh, it's 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 all natural, it's eco friendly, uh, it's sustainable, um, and and this is for me was the, the way we live today. So it was a great segue to enter beauty. That way, you know, my wife and I and the kids changed several years ago the way we live. Mm. We be careful. We are very cautious about the ingredients we use. I know you do too. You know. Um, uh, uh, the ingredient we use for food, uh, drinks, the way we don't uh, we uh, we ban plastic mm. many years ago in our house. Mm. Um, we want to make sure that we are aware and live you know a, a relevant way today. So Bastide is, a, is the the answer to that. Bastide is a, basically a beauty line that is clean, with non toxic, with a, 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 a recyclable and recycled plastic, um, and uh, it's a, it's a it's a brand that uh, uh, carries to very sensual oil, so it's you know it's very s great scent, uh, uh, great sensual oil product uh, uh, for body, for face, and uh, and uh, fragrances. And I think if I could just make a, an observation, which I think is quite wonderful and very modern, even though it sounds quite old fashioned, it's actually very modern in branding. Um, that you, when when people talk about a family business. One thing one doesn't usually see the family. The family is sort of who runs the business, and I find it very touching how your family, inclu including the children, not very much, mm -hmm. but sometimes, mm -hmm. are seen in some of the ways that you present the business. It's almost as if you're inviting people into your home in Aix en Provence and bringing everyone along for the ride. And I think it's very, very progressive, and um, and really shows that you're treating your clients maybe just the way you're treating your children. I think that's a that's, really, that's what I got away from it. Thank you. That's key. Actually, you know, I, I keep saying this to, to, to everyone who work with me. So we want to make sure that we develop product and that every idea we have is something that we would like to have for ourselves, for our home. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, do we want that? Would we try that? Would we wear that? Would we use that? And if the answer is yes, then we go for it. But you're right. It has to be. It's like you know, uh, it's Christmas time now. It's holidays. You know, you it's about a gift. So I don't want to do. A, I send a gift to somebody that I wouldn't want for myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the same thing for business. So Bastide, you you um, launched with with Shirin, your your wife, and um, she's hugely involved with the business right alongside you, or maybe you right alongside her, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as is probably the case. Um, and now you have everything under uh, uh, one roof, under Blue Mistral. Um, so talk about the other two businesses. Fakai has recently bought back. Um, you also have Atelier Fakai. What's the difference between th those two businesses? So first, you know, to say the Bastida gave me the inspiration to go back in 2018 to 
by Fekai Bak, when I realized that we could do more than beauty. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, let's go back. Let's really reinvent Fekai, rebrand Fekai. And we bought it in November 2018. And uh, when we bought it, we realized that it was no longer one brand, Fekai, but it was two brands. Mm-hmm. The predecessor owner uh, had developed a brand called Atelier Fekai, the one by F- Atelier Fekai. So um, I'll say, okay, let's do that. So today we developed for Fekai uh, a whole line of product that has no silicone, no paraben, no sulfate, very clean. And we also uh, did the packaging uh, with a mold that we own uh, made with 95% of recycled plastic. Uh, we uh, uh, actually uh, are fortunate to have found an amazing uh, uh, manufacturer that in Canada uh, that has mined, they call mined plastic, food-grade plastic. And uh, uh, so it's 95% recycled plastic and it's 100% recyclable. Why 95% is because when you recycle plastic, the color of the plastic is a little bit grayish. Mm -hmm. So we had to paint the plastic and make sure that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we get the right color. But that paint is also 100% recyclable. So that's that's how. So we have this recyclable plastic. We have this incredible clean formula. And uh, that's for Fekai. And, uh, and then we have another brand called Atelier Fekai, which is much more uh, technical. So it's a brand that is uh, more dedicated for styling. Mm. So there is, it's treatment, but it's also styling. So it's a professional yes. line? It's, we'd call it professional grade, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So therefore, you, you have these three businesses. You are back at the helm of your own brand name. And which I find wonderful, by the way, I, as an anecdote, I, I just think the idea of when, when I read the article that you had done that, I was sort of, you know, fist pumping for you. Thank you. Um, but I think what's what's so interesting, given your history in the in the industry, you talked about the 80s, about a certain way of, you know, maybe then, by the way, it was very va va you know, the whole, uh, the way people, what beauty meant to people, to women. Um, I think it's very different today. Um, the idea that maybe even in fashion, uh, the uh, we talked about this uh, actually with Rossi um, about this notion that you, as an industry, are pushing something onto people. And today, with social media, with YouTube, with uh, the internet in general, consumers are so educated. They they learn about themselves by what they end up posting because mm-hmm. they start to realize there's a trend about what they actually like. And then they become the editor. Right. They are in control. Absolutely. So how have you seen beauty in your eyes change in your career? Because it's it's been an evolution, but I'd love to hear, and I, I know everyone else would love to hear um, some of the anecdotes that you have about the differences today versus in the past. It's, it's a very good question, uh, Mort. First of all, let's just say this, that, and this is the beauty of it, the innovation, the evolution, all of this is a reaction to the consumer. So, so, and whoever do not listen to the customer lose. Mm -hmm. So today, and if you see it, even, you know, the retailers now are forcing you to to uh, uh, declare, to announce which product you're using and to make sure that you fit in different categories if you're not in a clean beauty. Um, so the world has changed, as you said. It's a, Everybody is on the iPhone or the, their smartphone and they can have access to information right away. Mm-hmm. So they can check on the product, they can check on the ingredient, they can check... On, on the reviews and all of this. So you, today you have to be transparent and you have to be performant mm-hmm. and you have to be a true, trustfully. So we create lines today that are relevant to the lifestyle of people. Uh, it has to be, obviously, you know, there's different type of beauty. You know, there's the, the beauty that is uh, what I call the Kardashian beauty, you know, mm-hmm. where it's all made up and yeah. all prepared. And then there is, and this is what I, 
come in. There's there's this beauty that is about embracing your own beauty, natural, natural, yeah. but enhancing it, mm-hmm. enhancing it, and making sure that you 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 uh, create a beauty with your own beauty and not transforming it for just the sake of transforming to someone else for yeah. someone else's exactly. sake. We'll be right back. I want to take a second to explain to you why Traub is able to bring you the safari. We pride ourselves in being at the very center of a very global, very complicated consumer and retail landscape. And in our travels, as we help think, manage, and expand businesses in many different channels and geographies, we're able to meet and learn from some of the great minds in this industry, and it's really wonderful to be able to bring them to you. And in doing so, I hope that you, the listener, will be able to learn a little bit more about what we do at Traub as well. Back to the safari. And so th- that word natural and organic and paraben-free and all, the, all of this, it, it seems that it's becoming uh, table stakes uh, today. I mean, if, if brands who aren't going in that direction I think probably um, are having some trouble. Though I think at the premium end of the market, it's, one can afford to do that because it's more, it's more expensive to develop those products. Um, do you think that it's going to differentiate or, or lift brands that are more prestige from mastige because it's, uh, from a price point perspective, it's hard to be as, let's say, clean uh, at the mass market? So it's, you're just touching on a very important point. Two, three years ago, we couldn't do what we do today. The, the costs were too high. And first of all, you couldn't find the ingredients. They were not available. So today, because the demand is higher, so we have supply and demand, you know. So today we can uh, afford to do, you know, it's still a little bit more expensive, but it's not as expensive as it used to be. So the, the market is going that direction. I think everybody has to be aligned to it. First of all, the reglementation, even in Europe right mm-hmm. now, uh, it, it's all about that, you know. When I go shopping, you, you do too. When we go to shopping in uh, in uh, in Europe, you know, you don't have a plastic bag. I mm. mean, you know, you, you, yeah, they're being banned everywhere. Think, exactly. Right? Yeah. So, Even in New York, in some parts. Exactly. So, so it's it's really about today. It's really about uh, having great performance, great product with uh, ingredients that n- they're not necessarily all natural, but they are safe, mm. and, and that's that's the, the important thing. So one thing that's a, sort of a random question, but kind of interesting speaking to you, who famously at the beginning of your career was known for color, mm-hmm. uh, for not only creating incredible uh, style and, and, and coloration for, for your clients, but also products that would maintain the color and et cetera. Color today uh, in the Instagram uh, generation, particularly for Gen Z, I'm noticing that a lot of young women are coloring their hair but they're actually coloring it with colors that you wouldn't expect uh, of our generation. Um, maybe, you know, uh, in, in pinks and greens and blues. And I think of Billie Eilish, uh, the famous, uh, um, you know, uh, YouTube star be- who became one of the, the biggest uh, musicians of our time. You know, she, her hair is changing color every week. And I'm seeing that happening a lot across that world. Do you think that the hair is now going through a renaissance and that hair care products and color will end up uh, maybe sort of catching up with that cultural phenomenon that I just described? This is very interesting. I think it, it, the phenomenon today is actually that millennial and Gen Z wants, want to do the opposite of what their parents did. So you're right. So Isn't that always the case? <laughs> it's always the case. But they are, they are really uh, uh, vocal, very, uh, you know, rebellious about it. And uh, yes, we see all these colors that are absolutely extraordinary, you know, the pink, the lavenders, the green and all this. And then, you know, that same generation is really interested and and caring about ingredients, Hmm. uh, the provenance, the sustainability, you know, the sourcing, all of this. They are very involved. So so there's two sides of it, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the... the rebellious side where they use, uh, you know, bleach and uh, very uh, outrageous color, but then they would go and have, you know, a herbal tea and uh, organic uh, everything, egg cream, exactly. But I think what's what's really interesting though about what you just said is that presumably the pink fluorescent pink hair 
uh, product is not uh, something that is clean, right? And then they go off on the other side. And so there's a yes. there's a, there's this interesting thing about wanting to project an image. And if I want to get that image across, I'll do it at any cost, mm -hmm. even if it's not mm -hmm. clean. Mm -hmm. But then in other parts of my of my life, I will I'll be um, more true to what I believe. It's exactly. kind of interesting. Speaking about sort of certain renaissances that are happening, Rossi, again, I keep on referencing him because uh, I think he's a guy that you, you and he have similar views in the world um, from, from Milk. Uh, but this idea that, that these young people are, are going through a renaissance, there's another renaissance that's happening uh, that is in the men's beauty space. Um, do you have uh, thoughts and, and opinions on what's happening in, in the men's business? Will it grow the way people seem to think it's going to grow? Or is it something that maybe a little bit overplayed? You know, I think men always comes a little bit later. And the, the reason is, uh, at least in the United States, is men are consuming, they, they are consumers online or their spouse will do the, the buying for them. So so they're basically reactive of what their wife uh, will, will buy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the good news about the men is that it's, it's a very fast growing business. Before, men were really much generic in their regiment of beauty. Mm -hmm. Today, we realize that actually using, you know, they used one or two products before, now they're using two, three products. Mm -hmm. So they are caring about uh, the product they're putting on their hair, the shaving cream that they use. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do realize myself that I don't want, you know, any shaving cream. I don't use IOSO or I don't use anything that has, you know, petroleum in it. I'll just go with something very much more organic and healthy. But men are, are caring. They are caring about beauty. They are they they're spending more time about, you know, they go to have the their hair done. They ha they go to have the the even manicure and stuff like that. So I think it's it's interesting the ma the market and in Asia we know that men are really spending a lot of money uh, on their uh, beauty. Hmm. Moving on to brand building. You know, you you have um, always have to look at brand building in the age in which you're doing it. Um, I'm reminded of how when you were selling at the beginning uh, shampoo and, and products to women, a uh, luxury brand, people weren't used to spending a lot of money on those products. They were very much generic, uh, over-the-counter, pharmacy-type products. Not dissimilar to that time, Gloria Vanderbilt started um, giving or producing jeans that were double, triple the cost of Levi's and people thought she was crazy. And, and then you had the premium jean revolution. When you were building the brand, what did you have to do then? And what are you, what, what are you thinking of now about you know, how you communicate the, what it's worth and, and, and why people are um, coming to you versus someone else? It's a very good question. So... Let's not forget that when I started the business, hair care were a commodity. You know, both in salons and product. The salons were generic. They were pretty much, I called it, reactive business. They were waiting for the customer and servicing the customer, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And we changed that. We talked about it earlier. But now in product, you know, the same thing. I would see, you know, customer like uh, my wife, your wife, or friends, and you know, they would have a, a, a very expensive uh, handbags or watches, accessories, and you know, and and then uh, uh, I would ask them at the station. I said, you know, what are you using uh, for your face, for your skin? So it would be uh, for three, four ounce uh, a product like uh, uh, La Mer or uh, La Prairie or so on, which is like three hundred dollars for three ounces. And I said, and what do you use on your hair? And that price dropped to six ninety nine, yeah. eight ninety nine. Mm -hmm. So I said, "This is not right. It's 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 very it's it's very close and not the face to the hair." So I approached the hair care differently. I used instead of going to the uh, hair care labs, I went to the skin care labs and really used the technology of skin care. Skin care were much more advanced, much more innovative, much faster mm -hmm. on, 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 on innovation. So I created, uh, created a hair care based on skincare technology and treated the hair like skin. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, skin, uh, um, hair is, is a, 
uh, you know, there's so many different types, and especially with color-treated hair. So, so I want to make sure that we had product that were very specific to every every woman, and that really catered to a different mind. And by doing that, you know, I hired at the time Baron Fabien Baron, the, the art designer, and created a packaging that looked more skincare, as opposed to hair care. And I find myself sitting on a shelf next to Chanel or Estee Lauder's, as supposed to be in a drugstore yes. uh, next to, um, uh, you know, the mass, mar- mass market brand. So we talked about this um, touching, anything that touches the body. You know, we talked about plastics. We talked about food earlier. Um, ingestibles, uh, the, the, the benefits of certain products that one can eat, um, whether they be pills or drinks uh, to benefit the hair, the skin, whatever it may be. Do you see ingestibles in the future of any of your brands? It's a very, uh, uh, you know, touching point. Um, it, this is very important to me, actually. You know, again, it's the way I live. I I use supplement myself. So I think it's so important that, uh, uh, and this is what I meant by earlier, by being transparent and trust, trustful to the customer. You cannot just sell a cream or a shampoo or a conditioner. Yes, you can produce amazing product and all this. You need to guide your customer with what I call supplement. Not necessarily the literary supplement, mm. but supplement of your life. Mm. How do you sleep? How do you eat? How do you, you know, how do you live? And, and it, what is your deficiency? You need to know your own wellness, your own beauty to create uh, your, 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 uh, a beautiful longevity uh, uh, um, style. So, yes. Uh, I always suggest to 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 get great uh, supplement to uh, to um, complement your regimen. So inspiration. Um, what's what, what's what's keeping you excited? What are the things uh, in the marketplace, uh, events within the consumer landscape that are inspiring you right now? You know, I think it's so great to see that. Uh, first of all, because of the technology that we have uh, uh, accessible today is to create, uh, you know, a universe of product that help everyone finding their own confidence. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't talk about just beauty and style. Mm-hmm. It's because... Swagger, yeah. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, that one, that's what makes somebody powerful, sexy, beautiful. You know, it's about confidence, self-confidence. And your self-confidence, self-confident, what you know that... Whatever you have, your clothes, your glasses, your hair, your skin, feels great. Mm-hmm. So we have a saying in French, uh, se sentir bien dans sa peau. So which means, you know, f- to feel great with your skin, you know, uh, within your skin. So I think that's what it is. To me, it's like, you know, today the technology helps us. It's getting better and better, by the way. So we can, today, our message actually is I creating beauty product to take care of you and the planet. So what do you think about, uh, you, know, you just delivered these messages, which I find are obviously inspirational and something that many people want to hear. There's content that can be developed. There's content that I'm sure you do develop uh, internally. And one of the things you referenced earlier was uh, Inside Out. And I, I talk about in, in, in our work, having companies become Inside out and upside down. Upside down meaning have young people inform the older people of what the hell is going on. And inside out about being completely transparent and opening sort of the, the, the inner workings of the business to be uh, trust. It, it engenders trust to, to be like that. So how do you uh, build a brand in the age of content? Uh, obviously, it's all about product. We know that. But it's increasingly also about communication and the brand being the influencer, not just hiring influencers uh, and obviously your brand is lucky enough to have you and Shirin involved who obviously are known and, and, and have names but how, how do you feel about now building brands in the age of content? You know I wanted to say you said you know it's about product L- let me just say that I see it differently I think a brand the product is a derivative of the brand to me a brand it's a story it's a it's 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 an offering it's a proposal and if that proposal comes to to life the product is great and uh, it's it, and that's why it's content 
It's first of all, before producing a product is what do we do it? What does it bring? How is it affecting not only you, but the environment and everything? So to me, it's about, you know, it's about making sure that you get the customer engaged, excited, buying it. When I say buying it, not literally buying it, buying the idea, buying the, buying the concept, it, yeah. buying into it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that's, that's to me the most exciting part is to make sure that uh, I, I'm communicating with the customer, that I'm, I'm getting a, a, a feedback, I'm getting a, a reaction and, uh, uh, and then creating a product that uh, 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 is endorsed and uh, we all can go for it. And so but therefore on the communication of that beyond through the product on the website or on Instagram or on YouTube, or I mean, uh, what are the things that you're playing with, even though you may not have done them yet, or maybe you're beginning to do them, that you feel are other other mediums through which to communicate this same message? It's a very good question. We are right, you know, we just bought the brand, so we yeah. are really are, uh, developing a whole, uh, I would have called production mm -hmm. of, uh, of content. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's obviously uh, being active on all social media, Instagram, TikTok now, uh, Pinterest. I mean, I love all this. And uh, the podcast today, um, and, uh, you know, YouTube, uh, all of this. So we are uh, actually, as we speak, uh, uh, produce, uh, having a studio, uh, buying a studio right now to develop all of this. That's fantastic. So, so we are taking this you know, more like exactly a production company yeah. uh, and, and creating content. Uh, uh, all the time. All the time. And uh, you have been in this industry uh in the, you know, people think of you as being in the hair care industry or the beauty industry, but really you've also been in the fashion business because it's been about, you know, the connectivity of beauty to, yes, the supermodels and the models and the, the, the fashion designers. And you, so you've had a front row seat, um, no pun intended, to that industry. How, how do you feel that um, is morphing as an industry? Because we talked earlier about the push versus pull. Mm -hmm. uh, Fashion's always been about, you know, this is what you should wear. And um, how, do you, how do you think it's changing? You know, uh, I, I, to me, I'm very interested on the whole picture of someone. So I've always been, always been interested by fashion and making sure that fashion is the best complement to beauty, okay? So, again, it's about confidence. It's about style. It's, for me, it, every time is about guiding and not dictating. I, I want to make sure it's guiding, influencing, and uh, perhaps it becomes directional, but influencing consumer mm. to have a style. And fashion is not about trend. It's about, you know, creating ideas. The same, I approach the same thing as beauty, is that making sure it's something that really fits your personality, your lifestyle, and that becomes a trend. Because if you do something that is just because it's... Uh, looking good on Instagram today, what do you do uh, uh, tonight or tomorrow with it? So uh, to me, that's the way I approach fashion is by making sure it's really fitting your personality, your humor, your, your lifestyle, your, and, and all of this. So, so then it becomes a trend. So in closing, um, what's, what's next for the, the brands of Blue Mistral? Uh, what are you excited about? What's coming down the pike that you can speak about that um, you're quite enthusiastic for? You know, uh, I'm very excited. First of all, we are now, uh, as I said, developing amazing product, but uh, creating, uh, you know, we are going back to Europe where we were before. And so we are reopening our business in Europe and we are about to enter also China. So I'm very excited about that. We have manager that is based in Hong Kong. Lots of airplanes in your future. <laughs> yes, but we have a great manager in Hong Kong that where, where we speak every every week. Uh, we have a conference call every week and just getting a sense of what the market is there and uh, how we can go and penetrate and you know we know how different it is. And so it's it's very exciting. It's just very exciting to see. And in fact, you know, we also just decided last week to have a little advisory board of millennial and Very Gen good. Z. So we're going to have five or six young, you know, 
uh, uh, person coming to the office every month and, and brainstorming ideas. Well, you know who else did that three years ago? Marco Bizzari at Gucci did what he called the Shadow Executive Committee. And when he had his executive committee meetings, he would put in the room next door the Shadow Executive Committee, and they were everyone had to be under 30 years old. And then they would, at the end, they would mix the meetings and they would learn from each other, right? And so if, uh, if Gucci is any testament to what that will do for you, um, I think lots of very good things are about to happen. I agree. I agree. What a, I mean, my hat to Marco. I mean, that, what a great job they've done. And uh, yes, exactly. It's very inspiring and we hope we get there. Well, it's inspirational to have you. I can, I can feel a completely, uh, you're always a pretty high energy guy, but I have even, an even higher level of energy coming off you today. So thanks so much for joining us on the safari today. Thank you, Mark, for having me. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io, where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it. Until next time.